Hello everyone, welcome back. It's Monday, November 6, 2023. Lots been going on between Israel and Hamas. The IDF looks to complete their encirclement of Gaza City. We have a bunch of Hamas fighters waiting inside, kind of having that noose around their neck, just getting squeezed as these IDF tanks, armored columns come down the beaches, come down the eastern side of Gaza City, looking to kind of swoop in, cut the Gaza Strip in two. All the civilians are moving to the south, half the hospitals have been knocked out, half the health centers have been knocked out, civilian casualties approaching or passing, you know, 10,000, probably a lot more missing too. Total mess, civilians moving south. IDF still targeting the south too, which is a little bit concerning. Some of these, you know, refugee camps or humanitarian corridors are getting hit. You know, it's a war of attrition, total war. It's pretty ridiculous. It's like, we're killing your civilians you're killing our civilians like let's let's play you know total war guys so that's kind of what we're going to be focusing on for this video kind of the tactics strategies being employed tactics and strategies are different so people use those words interchangeably but they're different we'll discuss that as well so you have these uh idf armored columns moving into the gaza strip breaking down that wall that was separating Israel and you know the kibbutzes and the IDF bases from the Gaza Strip they've broken that down they're sending in their tanks to clear out those fields and open areas around Gaza City employed to a great effect it didn't seem to take more than like five days to completely wipe that area out you know the tanks really thrive in that environment a tank has a driver loader gunner tank crewman they, they have a little grunt phone on the back, so a little infantry can run up to the back of the tank and be like, he's over there, he's 500 meters that way, point the gun that way. Tank's main gun, Sabo round, 120 millimeter round, you know, very big bullet going very, very fast. I, I've seen tanks shoot, guys, so at, at 29 Palms, California, when we were training as a mortarman, we could watch the, you know, we'd do combined arms exercises, and we'd shoot our little mortars, and then the tanks would come, and we could watch the tanks shoot targets with their main gun. Um, I, if I had to guess the max range, because I think that information is pretty well classified, but miles, guys, like these, these tanks can really engage targets out to like, you know, I want to say like 1,500 meters, they'd have no problem with, you know, and an AK-47 is only shooting effectively out to maybe 300 meters. So, you know, the, the IDF with their armor and their optics, their thermal optics and NVGs too, which gives them a serious edge, and all their little accessories on the tank, like the medium machine gun that's a coaxial and maybe a 50 cal or another medium machine gun on the top. You know, these tanks are very well armored and very well equipped with all sorts of clicks and whistles on them, cool optics, state-of-the-art technology. They really, you know, going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Hamas fighters who have no armor to throw against the IDF. You know, they're just, they're getting taken care of pretty quick. They're getting taken out with the trash. You know, they might have RPGs, recoilless rifles, shape charges. They might be able to get some mobility kills on these tanks. They might be able to knock out like one tank, but even that would be very difficult to do. Some of these IDF tanks, I'm watching videos, they can take multiple RPGs hits and just, you know, not even a mobility kill, not even blow a tread on them. So pretty crazy. But I will say these IDF tanks, they're gonna start running into problems as they move into Gaza City. N narrow streets, narrow alleyways, tanks can really get bogged down in that have a hard time maneuvering, hard time seeing targets. Maybe they're engaging targets too closely. You know, I've seen videos of uh, Hamas fighters shooting RPGs at very close range from inside buildings. Guys, that to me is absolutely control out of control. When you fire a shoulder fired system, like whether it's just like a law rocket or an AT4 or an RPG, you know, if you as the user had to absorb the kick from that rocket, it'd throw me through that wall. I'd get thrown completely through that cinder block wall if I had to fire an RPG and actually handle the recoil. So the way it works is when you shoot one of these RPGs, it expends all that gas, all that energy out the back, which is why when you watch a video of somebody shooting a rocket launcher, they shoot it and they stay still. It's just like, Poof, but then dust is just like, Poof, and they get completely hidden in a cloud of like dust and smoke. So their recoil was like, but the, the real recoil, all that energy was getting thrown out the back in like a 45 degree cone. You put your head behind that cone when they fire, you're dead. 
So when a rocket launcher is shooting, you don't have to just worry about the rocket flying out the front, but you also have to worry about the back blast area. If you're shooting down on a tank from a building through a window, it might throw you out the window. You know, in video games, you shoot the rocket launcher, whatever, no problem. But in real life, shooting multiple rockets in a row might give you a concussion easily. And the back blast on that might mess you up, might kill you, might kill your buddy. That's why when you fire a rocket, you know, back blast area all clear, or, you know, you look behind. I've seen videos, I think it was from Syria, of a fighter fire an RPG right when a guy ran behind him, killed him, knocked him over. I was like, he's not getting up. His head was right behind that thing. He didn't understand or wasn't ready for that back blast to come out the back. So anyway, Hamas fighters are engaging this armor at really close range. They're doing some really ballsy stuff, some crazy stuff. But also, you know, they have a death wish. It's really hard for the IDF to go against these fighters that are ready to be martyred. You know, they, they believe that once they're dead, fat, they have the, the gold passport to their heaven and they're ready to get it over with. They're not living for the joys of life. They, they consider the world, you know, a pretty fallen place and they know that their paradise awaits them. But it's very difficult to go up against an enemy that doesn't really put a, value, a lot of value on their human life. So they're getting in close. They're doing what they can to bog down the IDF and the IDF is coming in with the big guns, certainly outmatching them toe to toe. The Hamas fighters, they might only have like, you know, some AK-47s, which fun fact for you, 47 on AK-47, that's the year designator. So that piece of technology came out in 1947 and it's still the most widely produced weapon of war on planet Earth. You know, the AK-47, only eight moving parts, very good gun to give to conscripts, get a lot of bang for your buck. Uh, very reliable. I could train you on it in 30 seconds. Only eight maybe moving parts. Um, very simple to use, simple to fashion parts for, simple to buy mass quantities of, give them out to conscripts, and they, they do the job. You know, taking a 7.62 by 39 round would really suck. You know, the, the bullet at close range is very powerful, has a lot of force and momentum behind it. You know, the 5.56 five, that comes out of the AR-15 and probably what the IDF are using their 556 is probably what they're using. That's a very tiny bullet. It's going much faster than the AK bullet, but it's very tiny. So the AK bullet, it's like stumpy and fat and going, you know, kind of slow, maybe only 1300 feet per second, maybe 1800. But put things in perspective, the AR-15 is like 3200 feet per second. You know what I mean? 2900 feet per second. So the, basically, the gun that the average Israeli soldier is using shoots twice the velocity of what the Hamas fighter is using. But his gun, it only, you know, shoots slower. The bullet goes slower, but the bullet's fatter. It has a lot more energy, a lot more knockdown power. So the Israelis will, you know, they're going to stack on some of these doors in fire teams. And the first guy is going to kick the door in and they're going to go in, which is very dangerous. A very high casualty rate for the first guy in that stack. But anyway, they're gonna go in with their gun that shoots a very fast projectile. It's gonna be not very, not as effective at close range as the AK-47. Basically, if somebody said, hey, I have an AR-15 and you have to get shot with it, do you wanna get shot from one foot away or from a, a thousand meters? You know, I'd, I'd probably, I'd want one foot away because what's gonna happen is the bullet's gonna go in and out. And it's not a very big bullet, so it's not gonna create a very big permanent wound cavity. It might even be hard for the paramedics to find the entry. They're gonna be like, where'd the bullet go in? I see blood, but I can't find a hole. You know, it's gonna go in and it's gonna go out. But the problem when the IDF is engaging Hamas fighters up close is the bullet's just going in and out. It's at a thousand meters that the, that the five, five, six round starts to tumble. So it'll go in your leg, come out your neck, you know, go in your shoulder, come out your leg, like weird stuff. The bullet, and there's bullet shredding everything between there. So, you know, it's, it's horrible, guys. Basically, IDF using a smaller projectile going twice as fast. Hamas fighters using the AK-47 shooting a bigger bullet going half the speed. But that AK-47, you know, it doesn't take more than a couple of those bullets to really shatter the chest plate armor that these IDF guys, so, you know, it's, it's messy, guys. And they're gonna be doing this pretty close. Now, the IDF might be like, we're taking fire from a dozen Hamas fighters in that high rise over there. They back off, they just drop a 500 pound JDAM on it, like a thousand pound bomb, 500 pound bomb from their air support. But they're also gonna have times, buildings, tunnels, where they're gonna have to go in 
and clear it, you know? And you might think, oh, putting a knife on the end of your gun, that's for like 300 years ago. That's like the Civil War. That's like old timey. That's like the Revolutionary War. No, the U.S. Marines fixed bayonets in Fallujah in 2004, and it would not surprise me if IDF troops are even having to fix bayonets, the, the, the fighting getting hand to hand, you know, hand grenades going back and forth. Pretty crazy stuff, you guys. Pretty crazy stuff. So the IDF, they're not going to have a problem tactically clearing out around Gaza City. They're going to have some problem actually capturing the center of Gaza City, but it's not going to take, I don't think, more than a couple weeks. The problem is, even though is the IDF tactically was sound and you know they're going to capture the city, well, they're going to put patrol bases in Gaza City and the, the security situation and four months from now, six months from now, start thinking about that. You know, the U.S. coalition had no problem actually capturing territory in Iraq and Afghanistan. Like, we can take the village. You know, oh, you got 900 Taliban fighters in a village. We're going to take it, like, tomorrow, by tomorrow. And we do. But then the problem is we put a PB in the village, and then the PB gets attacked on a weekly basis for the next seven months. And every time you push out a patrol, there's, like, bombs waiting for you. So I think... You know, Hamas is going to get pretty well taken care of uh, going, trying to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with IDF. But then the ensuing weeks and months, the security situation for the IDF is going to be, like, pretty scary. Hamas fighters are going to want to do the bulk of their fighting in the morning or the evening because it kind of messes with IDF optics. You can also kind of use the sun in your favor. You know, if you start a complex ambush while the sun's going down and you're between your enemy and the sun, they, you know, you, they start taking fire from the right, they look over, they just see a setting sun and a glare, you know. So jihadists generally do that. They like to fight on their terms when, you know, of their choosing, when the weather's good. I know that sounds weird, but in Afghanistan, like if it was 44 degrees and rainy and cold, they weren't gonna attack. They didn't, they're like, no, today's not a good day. They'd wanna wait for like the perfect day. So when Hamas starts to get to fighting on their own terms in the months following Israel's capture of Gaza City, that's more what the IDF needs to be concerned about. But in the meantime, they are dealing with a very difficult battle space. You know, the urban warfare is very gnarly. It's a three-dimensional battle space. So you got like around you, you know, these buildings, windows, corners, close range, hard to see everything. You know, if I took you to a street and then I was like, look out, you'd see like 110 windows. Which one would the enemy be in? You know, that's difficult. But then there's also a fourth dimension because Hamas has this intricate system of underground tunnels that have been built for years and years and years. So. You know, the IDF has their work cut out for them, but I do think tactically they're going to be able to capture Gaza City. It's just strategically, are they going to be able to hold it? Is it going to turn into a PR nightmare if every time they send a new cycle of troops to the, you know, Gaza City to man these different patrol bases or supply routes, they're getting attacked all the time. You know, what's that going to look like? But the Hamas fighters, as far as the weapon systems they're using, they got... AKs, RPGs, recoilless rifles, some maybe some like shape charges. They'll definitely resort to IEDs, you know, improvised explosive devices, uh, both victim op operated and RC. So they'll have like IEDs that IDF troops trigger, like booby traps they step on, and then they're gonna have like potentially, I, I don't know this yet, but we'll probably see it, remote controlled IED attacks. So Hamas will put out like a daisy chain of IEDs and then they'll have a little clicker and they'll wait for the Israeli con you know, supply convoy to be driving by, and then they'll, right when the moment is perfect, they'll hit that little clicker and it'll blow up, and you know, they'll film it, because they, they just love, love filming that crap and putting it on the internet. So if you're in the IDF and you see uh, you know, a guy on a roof somewhere watching you, and then another guy with a camera, yeah, that, I would definitely stop the convoy there and get it, you know, start looking for IEDs. But anyway, it's gonna get crazy. Total war, war of attrition, civilian targets getting hit, hospitals getting hit, civilian infrastructure getting completely knocked out. Armor going in conjunction with air and infantry and sea. You know, IDF really looking to showcase their capabilities. Like we got everything covered, we're using it all, you know. Which is the Blitzkrieg, which uh, the Nazis came up with really. They. They kind of started the whole Blitzkrieg idea in World War II when they outflanked the French Maginot Line, like, no problem. Really, back in the day, armies could only advance at, like, walking speed, you know? So, off to take more territory. But the Blitzkrieg was this idea that, like, at 5.45 a.m., we're going to hit you with dive bombers. 
And once you're scrambling around, eight minutes later, the tanks are gonna come barreling through at 20 miles an hour, just blasting. The tanks are gonna create a big hole and then it's just gonna get flooded with infantry. And then as you try to escape, the artillery is just gonna be pounding away. And then the art, you know, it's all gonna be mutually supporting elements. It's like how we destroyed the Iraqi army you know, both times in a matter of like 72, 96 hours, you know, three or four days, we can destroy the seventh largest army on planet Earth with Blitzkrieg tactics. So the IDF's using that, employing that to great effect. Got that from the Germans. U.S. coalition uses it. So again, taking the actual ground, taking Gaza City. Yeah, it is going to suck. It's going to be messy. But the IDF tactically is going to be able to do it. But strategically, is it going to be of any value? Are they going to get anything out of it? Are they going to be able to bring security to the region? You know, that... That's the big what if. So we might see a tactical victory of Gaza City, but then a strategic defeat for the Gaza Strip. You see how, you know, or, or and just another scenario to help illustrate to you how tactics and strategy are different. The IDF sends in 10,000 troops to capture the center of Gaza City. You know, they lose 9,000 of them, but 1,000 are still left and capture the city. It could be seen as a tactical defeat but a strategic victory if they still capture the city and bring security to the region. So you see how strategy and tactics are different. Tactics, how you get there, the, me the means by which you achieve your objective, strategy, the, you know, what overall objective are you looking to achieve kind of thing. But anyway, the IDF is gonna have to deal with an insurgency. I know they already have been pretty much forever, but whoo, it's gonna be out of control. You know, we'll, we'll talk about hand grenades and I'll leave you off on this. In movies, you see hand grenades, like fireball, guy goes flying, whoa, you know, the main character casually rolling hand grenades around. Uh, in video games, you know, you cook your grenade, like you pull the pin and cook it, throw it. No, no, guys, hand grenades. Basically, to give you an idea of how this ground fighting is going to go, when you're throwing hand grenades, it, things have, are out of control. We throw hand grenades, not a fireball, okay? You, if, if, if I got to take you to a very secure location, which you can, it's illegal, but hypothetically, and we threw a hand grenade together, like I got, I got to let you throw it, I was kind of your instructor. Your takeaways would be, that is really loud. That is way louder than I thought. I remember in School of Infantry, uh, going to the grenade range, we could hear the grenade range from like five kilometers away before we even stepped off. So on a clear day, you can hear a grenade range from, a grenade from five kilometers away you know so that'd probably be your first thought is dang that thing was loud your second thought would be there was no fireball but there was a big poof of gray and black smoke that was pretty crazy and then your third um realization might be um wow the, the casualty rate on that could be a lot farther than i thought huh and the, and the reality is you can be injured by a hand grenade out to 200 meters you know 250 meters you can still catch frag some of the frag that's coming off of those hand grenades is going supersonic faster than a bullet so frag coming off hand grenades going faster than a bullet. Weird, you know, because you have the frag from the grenade, tiny projectiles going very fast. That's some weird physics. And then you have secondary frag too. Like basically if somebody, you know, if we threw a grenade into a gravel pit and it blows up, well, you have the gravel now with secondary frag. Blades of grass, little rock pebbles, spark plugs, bike pedals, you know, whatever you can imagine that would go flying through the air can also hit the person, you know. If people are, you know, so we, we, you know, if you're stacking on a door and throwing grenades inside, first of all, just stacking on those doors, guys, fatal front. So the person that hits that doorway, their, their, their casualty rate is very, very high. And the IDF, they're not trained when they're clearing bu buildings to like stack on the door. And when the first guy goes in, if he starts getting hit, like back up and, and you know, run away and surround the building, they're just going to keep going in. That's how you do it. So they're just going to be pushing in and the first guy is going to be like catching all the AK bullets and the other three guys are going to come in behind him, neutralize the threat. And then another fire team of four is going to come in. They're going to clear the next room. It's going to look something like that. It's going to be rolling chaos, you know, if they're not just pulling away from the building and dropping a JDAM on it, which they're going to be doing a little bit of. But so, you know, if you're, you know, breach bang and clear and you're throwing a frag grenade into a room and then stacking on it and going in, my gosh, you know, hand grenades going off inside rooms uh, don't sign me up for that you know could have happened i guess i would have dealt with it but i'm um, you know and i and i know people who've been in the same room as hand grenades going off with them you know i knew marines that were in fallujah and probably know a lot about what the idf is going through right now you know fallujah saw some of the most intense fighting for the marine corps since the tet offensive of vietnam that only happened in 2004 you guys 
They were throwing hands, you know, they wrote the book on clearing rooms and urban warfare. They redefined everything. So IDF has a very difficult learning curve, very scary stuff in front of them. Same for Hamas. I mean, imagine, man, imagine trying to go up against one of these tanks that can see you from multiple grid squares away and employ weaponry on you that can hit you from, you know, pretty accurately from multiple grid squares away. You can't even get in close. If you get in close, can you imagine how terrifying that'd be the way the ground is like rumbling and you're trying to get into rocket RPG range so that you can maybe hope to score a mobility kill on one of these tanks and then avoid the other three tanks in this tank platoon with infantry and support and air that you just cannot run from? Man, so it's gonna be terrifying for everybody on both sides. And you got you got to know it's not fireballs and people flying through the air. It's it's much nastier than that, and it's much more concussive than you could imagine. You know, it wouldn't take more than a couple grenades going off near you for you to be on permanent disability for life. Your ears will be ringing for life. You know, you'll get tinnitus, severe hearing loss. You know, Hamas fighters getting bombed. You know, or just these civilians getting bombed. You don't need any damage to your physical person for the concussion to kill you. You know, sucks the air out, right out of your lungs, kind of thing. Israel says they're doing all these targeted precision strikes, but they're dropping like a thousand bombs a day, you guys. I don't know how precise you can be dropping a thousand five hundred to a thousand pound bombs per day. That's like one every few minutes. Crazy. A hand grenade, they'll tell you five meters is the kill radius. So if you're within five meters of a hand grenade, you're pretty well in the kill ra kill radius. You're gonna, you know, you're gonna die. And then if you're at 10 to 15, you're just in the casualty. So you're probably going to like catch some frag or some concussion, you know, probably, probably mess you up a little bit. But again, it can go out a lot further. So crazy, you know, and a lot of these bullets, like on these main guns for these IDF tanks and these 50 cal machine guns that they're using, they don't just stop in the wall. They keep going. You know, a 50 cal round will go through several walls. We had slap rounds in Afghanistan that we had to stop using. Look up. You can Google slap round 50 cal. It's like a tungsten, looks like a Hershey's kiss made of tungsten. It's like pointy. That thing would go through like 50 walls and it wouldn't stop. It'd just keep going and going and going. So crazy. There is a rumor that the air displacement from a 50 cal machine gun, a heavy machine gun, like a 50 cal, just the air displacement of the bullet passing by your arm can, can cut your skin and mess you up, but that's not true. Uh, so that is a wives tale though that the 50 cal which is very powerful you know and really used only against light armor like if you were to engage enemy troops in the open that were just dismounted like hamas fighters with ak's if you were to engage them with a 50 cal you know i mean you might have to do what you might have to do so i'm not say like don't engage them uh but it's not proportional you're probably breaking the geneva convention Using a 50 cal on individual people, which, you know, it's going to happen in there, is uh, insane. You know, we're talking limbs coming off. One 50 cal bullet in the civilian world, you can buy one, it's probably $12. You know, and they're just shooting loads of those things, the boxes of those things, you know. Uh, but the 50 cal isn't that good of a gun. So there you go, fun fact for you. You'd, you'd probably just overall want to go with the 240. The, the, the M240 is like the best machine gun. It's called in the Marine Corps the machine gun. Most machine gunners, that's an MOS, would tell you that's the best gun, the 240, the most reliable. You know, you must bang for your buck, just best all around machine gun. The 50 cal, you have to get headspace and timing right. It ha if you break down a 50 cal, it's like a lot of pieces. But anyway, I don't know. I, I think I'm allowed to tell you all this stuff. I think so. Yeah, we can talk about headspace and timing. I'm sure if you Googled the 50 cal, you wouldn't learn anything on this video you can't find online. But anyway, crazy weapon systems, you guys. Uh, so the rocket launchers with the back blast, the, the, the rifle bullets, the big Sabo rounds, you know, the talk a little bit about mortars. I mean, I was a mortarman, so I, I talk a lot about mortars, but I probably won't. Hamas probably has some mortars, and sh certainly I, I would say the IDF is going to be employing mortars. It's just another area of fire weapon. It's like a tube you put in the ground, you drop the round down, it shoots out the top. A little more complex than that. You have like a sight on a mortar. People don't know that. And you have like aiming stakes and a, I don't know. You need forward observers and but anyway mortars one thing i did see in the ukraine russia war and then i've seen i think a little bit of signs of or you will if you keep an eye out in uh gaza city shake and bake so we don't do it in the the u.s military where you call he with 
red or white phosphorus. White phosphorus, red phosphorus, it's supposed to be used for like marking and signaling, uh, but you could use it on enemy troops in the open. It's, it's against the Geneva Convention, but basically it rains down molten lava. Creates a lot of fire, a lot of smoke, can't put out the fire. So if you got like white or red phosphorus on your skin, it's just gonna keep burning down to the bone and keep burning, you know. Nasty stuff, you can put it under water, it'll go out and then take it above water, it lights back up again. Really nasty stuff should not be used on humans, but you're gonna see shake and bakes. And when you call a shake and bake fire mission, that's just like a bunch of HE and a bunch of uh, red and white phosphorus. And you're just, you know, hitting them with like everything. Things that explode, HE, high explosive, and then phosphorus. You're like, you know, it air bursts and then it fires like lava everywhere basically so it's not what you think in movies and uh video games and even what you kind of see on tv you guys i guess that's really what this video is supposed to highlight for you guys kind of the situation right now in gaza city but then you know the realities of war like what's what it's actually you know kind of like i can only speak in theory what what is going on but i you know trained for it know knew a lot of guys that kind of went through it so you know Thanks for hanging out with me. We'll reconvene as things progress and uh, we're just gonna keep going, all right? Till next time.